Hey everyone, welcome to session 188 of the Behavioral Observations Podcast. In today's episode, I am joined by doctors Jill Dardig and Bill Heward. We talk about a whole host of things, including their new book, Let's Make a Contract, A Positive Way to Change Your Child's Behavior. Like I said, we talked about a whole host of topics, including the following, uh, how Bill and Jill discovered behavior analysis, especially at a time when it wasn't nearly as ubiquitous as it is now. We talk about how they met each other, and uh, so, uh, spoiler alert, there's a little bit of a love story involved here. We talk about the earlier iteration of this book titled Sign Here, a contracting book for children and their parents, and the success that they had in getting this work, as well as Let's Make a Contract, translated in various languages and distributing these books across countries all over the globe. It's a real great story of dissemination. We talk about the power of storytelling. And of course, we go over the basics of behavioral contracting, um, and then we talk about special circumstances that make contracting challenging to do, and what to do about that, what to make of the open economy of today's screen-based reinforcers, the directions for future research in the area of contracting, uh, advice for the newly minted, and their hopes for the future of applied behavior analysis. This bullet list, of course, that I just rattled off could go on and on. There's many storylines in this conversation, from the history of ABA to dissemination across cultures and languages, etc. So I think there's something in this episode for just about everybody. Uh, Just as a programming note or a housekeeping note, uh, I should mention that we get to the actual mechanics of behavioral contracting about half to two-thirds of the way through the conversation. Uh, And and throughout our conversation, they just tell a lot of great stories that translate into essentially very good parenting advice. So if you're a parent who struggles with your child's behavior or if you support parents in that role, uh, again, I think there's just a lot of great take-home, I guess, nuggets of information throughout this conversation. So I hope you enjoy it. Um, I also want to let you know that we talked about numerous resources, and I've done my best to track them all down in the show notes for this episode. So just go to behavioralobservations.com and look for session 188. I should also note, too, uh, if you go to the website, there's a little pop-up thing that allows you to hop on my email list. And if you do that, you get the show notes sent directly to your inbox. So so you'll never have to go to behavioralobservations.com again. Uh, Unless you want to buy CEUs, of course, that's a different conversation. But if you want to get the show notes for these episodes directly to your email inbox, go to behavioralobservations.com and just fill out the contact information and the little little pop-up window, and you are good to go. Before we get to Jill and Bill, I do want to let you know that we are brought to you by HRIC Recruiting. Go to hricolorado.com to schedule a confidential chat right away with Barb Voss and find out if she can help you find your dream job. We're also brought to you by Behavior University. Their mission is to provide university-quality professional development for the busy behavior analyst. Learn about their CEU offerings and their new eight-hour supervision course over at behavioruniversity.com forward slash observations. Last but not least, we're brought to you by the University of Cincinnati Online. The UC Online Masters of Education and Behavior Analysis program is 100% online and asynchronous, meaning you log on when it works for you. If you want to learn more, go to online.uc.edu and click the Request Info button. Okay, that's it for opening remarks. So without further delay, let's get to this conversation with Drs. Jill Dardig and Bill Heward. Welcome to the Behavioral Observations Podcast, stimulating talk for today's behavior analysts. Now, here's your host, Matt Sicoria. All right, Dr. Jill Dardig and Bill Heward, thank you so much for joining me today. How are you guys doing today? We're, we're fine. How are you? We're doing great. Thanks. Uh, this is, uh, I'm doing great too. It's a, a so glad you guys are able to do this. We've got a really fun book to talk about that you guys just published. It's called Let's Make a Contract. Uh, we're going to get into all about contracts. I'm really excited because it's some, it's a, a strategy I haven't really employed all that much in my career. 
I'm willing to bet that's probably the same with lots of behavior analysts who are listening to this. Uh, and we can maybe talk a little bit about why that might be the case, uh, but certainly something that has a, a, a long history behind it. And uh, man, I'm just really excited to, to learn more about it. So uh, before we get into the, the book, though, uh, I'd like to start the show like we always do here and uh, get a little bit of background. Um, I always like to pe- ask people how they started in behavior analysis. Uh, and so I would love for you guys to fill us in a little bit on the, I guess, history of your uh, encountering the field and deciding that this is something you want to do as a, a you know, a, as, as, a, as an occupation and things like that. And then after that, we could certainly get more into the book and things along those lines. So if you guys could kind of take it away with that, that would be a great place to start. Well, for me, it's kind of ancient history. It goes back to the 1960s when I was in college. I was an undergrad at um, Mount Holyoke College in Massachusetts and um, started out as a math major and kind of morphed into an art major. But my um, my minor was psychology and education. And um, how did I get introduced to ABA? Well, in my intro psych class, the textbook had maybe a paragraph or two on B.F. Skinner, and it was mentioned in passing during class. So that was my initial tiny little contact. But um, in the psychology building where I had my classes, very often I'd walk into the lobby and there would be pigeons flying around everywhere, just here and there, like dozens of pigeons. And there was a woman who was kind of chasing after these pigeons and doing something with them. I didn't quite know what she was doing. Um, But eventually I found out that uh, this woman who I thought of as the pigeon lady was actually Ellen Reese. Uh, Ellen was a very early researcher in in our field. Um, she did operant conditioning of mostly animals, but also humans as well. And she had a lab going in the, the site building where she would train pigeons. So um, I never took a class with her, but at some point, one of my site classes was invited to her, her home to actually see some of her work in action. And so one night, remember, it was, uh, it was really dark and she lived with her husband way out in the woods somewhere in Western Massachusetts and they loaded us into cars and we pulled up to our house, this dark house. And outside were maybe five or six big German shepherds, really scary looking dogs. And um, so we kind of reluctantly got out of the car. And then Ellen, the pigeon lady, now the dog lady, I guess, Ellen Reese, um, put these dogs through their paces. It's what you might now think of as a, an agility course. She mm-hmm. had them jumping hurdles and they were so docile. They were so beautifully trained. And that was really my first time seeing what we call the behavior modification in action. So that was really kind of an exciting thing uh, for me to see. And then kind of fast forward a couple of years later, I was entering grad school at UMass Amherst in um, educational media and communications. And just randomly, my um, advisor who was assigned to me told me that there was a GRA position available um, to be an assistant to Dr. Todd Egas, who was a faculty member at UMass. And uh, he was the associate director of a regional media center, a huge federal project that developed uh, media for deaf children. So I came to his office for my interview. We had a nice little chat. And then at the end of it, he said, now, I want you to read this paper. He handed me a paper, like a 20-page paper. He said, read this, come back in a couple of days and we'll discuss it. So I did that. I got home and it was a paper by Jack Michael on the principles of behavior. And it was a fabulous paper. I was so uh, just so engaged in reading and I couldn't put it down. It was so interesting. It was so relevant. It was so straightforward. I really, really loved that paper. So then I went back to Todd's office and um, we discussed it and I got the job. After that, he gave me things to read. First, I read um, Behavior Principles, which was published maybe in 68 or so, the first or in Perot book. And that really gave me a broader look at behavior analysis. And then from there, it was just reading on my own and um, reading of necessity when I was working with kids, trying to figure out what what to do with kids with autism and other disabilities. So to some extent, I was self-taught and taught through experience. Bill has a completely different story, though, to tell. And we both end up at UMass Amherst. <laughs> okay. All right. So I, I grow up in a one-stop light 
farm town, southwestern Michigan, Three Oaks. And uh, it was all about everything was all about baseball for me. Um, I ate, slept, played baseball. I was just knew I was going to be a, a pitcher for the Chicago Cubs. We got uh, WGN and all the Cubs games on the TV there because just right around the bottom of Lake Michigan. So um, still have Ernie Banks, my hero baseball card of Ernie Banks that carry my wallet today. And so um, Western Michigan Broncos, uh, the time I'm finishing up high school, were actually ranked number four in the nation in D1 baseball. Absolute powerhouse. And I had some small college scholarship authors, but boy, this was the chance. It was only an hour and change away Kalamazoo from Three Oaks up I-94. I'd be able to hitchhike back and forth to, to college. And so I go to Western and, um, you know, you have to take classes, son. You be, That's right. <laughs> I said, okay, I'll take some classes. You're yeah, not I'll just there to play baseball. Before I'm at Wrigley Field, you know. So, well, everybody takes intro to psychology. Uh, and I did. Still have all six books. I'm pointing to the bookshelf across the way here in our home library and office that uh, Dick Malott used in that first class. This is uh, 1968. I came in the fall of 67. Just coincidentally, that's the same year Jack Michael came as a faculty member uh, to Western. So that first class, 15 week semester, Malott had it organized. It was a real pyramid scheme. It was tremendous. Uh, Dick uh, would do a big lecture. There, there were literally something like 1,200 students enrolled in this. Western had a big nursing uh, preparation program. It was required of all nursing students. And, you know, just real common course for college students to take an intro to psychology. So it was called Psych 150. And what it was was a, a, an introduction to B.F. Skinner, behavior analysis, the philosophy of uh, of behaviorism, uh, six books, uh, and seven and a half weeks were what they called seminar, and you had a reading assignment every day, and the next day, a three or four question quiz. You got study objectives to help you, you focus on uh, what you were expected to get from, uh, from the reading. The other seven and a half weeks was, was Rat Lab, and at that time, Every student in that course had uh, his or her own you know, white albino rat. Of course, I may name mine Ernie. Uh, unfortunately, my rat was a little slow, uh, and I berated him. I talked about what's the matter with your family history? Didn't you get enough sleep last night? You know, pay attention. I'm talking to you. All the things we do as teachers and, and parents when you know our student isn't learning like they're supposed to. Um, but eventually the contingencies of the course and uh, Ernie's responses to my initially pretty pathetic efforts to, uh, to shape, um, shape me into uh, learning how to pay attention better to what was relevant in his uh, environment and learn to shape, shape him to press a lever and then press a lever, but only when a little light was done uh, in the Skinner box, but not press it was when it was off and and some intermittent reinforcement and extinction and the little pencil and paper and you're recording all these lever presses as a as a function of what was going on and uh, in Ernie's environment and then the, the, the final what they called the cookbook um, uh, uh, experiments that every student went through was it was chaining and uh, you taught you were at to press the lever, but only after the light came on and the light didn't come on until he had nosed a marble across the floor of uh, the little box. And the marble wasn't nosed until he pulled a little chain that they he dropped through the roof of there. So that was my, my, uh, my introduction to the basic principles uh, of behavior and how they might be used to, um, to, to, to really change, but remarkably, uh, change uh, behavior. I said, this is cool. I'm going to take more psych classes. And what, what it was, was a whole program in behavior analysis. My next uh, semester, the spring of 68, I took child development with Don Whaley. And he used the classic 
Bijou and Bear books, uh, Child Development, uh, published in like 61 or 62. And I'm a sophomore in the, the fall of 68, and I have Jack Michael teaching verbal behavior. Oh, boy. Now, uh, those of us uh, that, you know, everybody who's experienced uh, Jack in his later later years, uh, still delivering just a powerful presentations and lectures, they just walk out of a conference and say, oh, my goodness, does he speak fast? All I say, you should have seen him back in the day. <laughs> you know, yeah. it was just... I just came and, back uh, from the. I, I just uh, made me think of. I just came back from the verbal behavior conference, and yeah. uh, there was uh, obviously you, you can't encounter that conference without many, many references to uh, yeah. uh, to Jack Michael. Mark Sunberg actually gave a talk about what it was like to be uh, a student of Jack's, and mm-hmm. uh, so yeah, yeah. <laughs> there were there were no shortage it's, of Jack Michael stories for sure. And so it sounds it, from it yeah. just sounds uh, very much similar to your your yeah, experience. Yeah, no, it's wonderful them. to listen to Mark and Kyle Miguel. They talk about uh, their interactions with uh, with with Jack, and well, I I, I won't uh, belabor this, but I. Uh, Took courses from uh, from David Lyon, learned about uh, behavioral suppression, uh, um, and then uh, a couple of uh, more rat and pigeon labs uh, with Malad, a course on statistics of all things with Jack Michael. Got to uh, help run some uh, experiments in uh, Roger Ulrich's primate lab. And and then uh, what really was my kind of first experience and what led to, you know, you talked about an occupation later, it really became my field and Jill's is special education. Um, the faculty had some projects in the community. Uh, Ulrich had one that would really be similar to early Head Start. Uh, it's kind of a uh, early intervention preschool opportunity for, um, uh, for, for children in the community. Uh, there was another project, and then there was still a very large state institution for people with uh, uh, significant uh, developmental disabilities and behavior challenges. And so as an undergraduate, uh, I got to experience firsthand for the first time and try my amateur hand at, um, you know, applying these basic principles to, to make a difference in, uh, in, in people's lives. Okay, I graduate from Western. The Cubs hadn't called yet. I couldn't give up baseball. <laughs> and I find myself barnstorming around the country uh, with a team called the Indianapolis Clowns. And we play in a different town every night all over the country. But just before I had left in uh, around April of 1971, of course, the Vietnam War was just full on raging at that time. And uh, the federal government did uh, a birth date lottery mm. uh, and uh, using February 15th to get all 100, 366 birth dates. They, this was on national TV. They literally yeah. drew birth dates and the lower your number, the more likely you're going to be drafted high numbers. You're never going to be. Well, I'm number nine. So, you know, it's just a matter of uh, a week's where I'm going to get a, get the call, but uh, finish up the semester. I'm out uh, barnstorming with the clowns. I'm calling home every other day to mom and dad, the old phones, and you put the nickels in. And, and then my dad says, well, we got, you know, the draft board. We got the letter. You need to be in Detroit for your physical you know, next week on Wednesday or whatever the day was. So I don't know. We're in the Carolinas or Georgia. I hop a bus. I come and I go through the physical. Um my dad drives me to O'Hare to fly back to meet the clowns who are now somewhere in Massachusetts because they're bouncing all over the place. And I'm flying standby. I take the last, uh, I get the last seat and I'm in the middle between this uh, marvelous woman. She seemed like a hundred years old to me then, you know, I'm a kid. She's probably in her sixties or seventies. She's telling me about her children, very proud of all the things they'd accomplished and it's impressive. One's a physician, one's a state Senator. And, you know, like you do, we solved all the problems of the world in an hour and a half flight to Bradley international and in Hartford. Every now and then this, this man sitting there, right. Would, he wasn't really in the conversation, but he'd say something or he'd ask something. And plane's about ready to land. And he introduces himself. He says, I'm, 
I'm Dwight Allen. I'm Dean of the School of Education at the University of Massachusetts. Um, I'd like you to come and visit tomorrow. I think you'd be great in our doctoral program. <laughs> and I said, yeah. He said, well, but, you know, my wife's going to meet me at the airport. And we were staying in Springfield, just north of, uh, uh, of Hartford. He said, we'll give you a ride to the hotel. It's okay. And Well, when I had, was in O'Hare before I boarded the plane, I grabbed a copy of Psychology Today. Didn't look at it. I put it in my duffel bag. I get to the hotel in Springfield, I open my duffel bag, I pull out psychology today, and the lead article is by Dwight Allen, Mr. Education of USA. This is, I, I still get the chair, this is just crazy. <laughs> wow. And he had said, take, you know, I thought this, this is a fairy tale. He says, well, take the Peter Pan bus to Amherst. I said, yeah, right. There's, and of course there is. There's a there is, yeah. Bus company, Peter Pan. Mm -hmm. And when I saw that article, I said, well, our game's at, at night back in Springfield. I'm, I'm getting on the bus in the morning. I got to see where this leads. Well, Dwight Allen was already gone on another trip. He had just been returning from Africa. He was going somewhere else. His assistant dean meets me. He shows me around. He says, you come in the fall, we'll have an assistantship for you. And he had to explain what that meant. And I said, well, all right. But I'm, you know, I'm going to go back out and sign with the Cubs or some other team. And I put it in the back of my head and hadn't signed with any team yet by the end of the fall. And well, I... I kind of like school and I'll, I'll go to UMass they're offering me. And I go and the Dean says, based on your interest, we have one faculty member who's uh, clearly a, a behaviorist. His name's Todd Ekes. And he runs this, he's the director of yeah. associate director of the program. He says, why don't you go meet him? I go see Todd. I tell Todd about, well, I studied with Dick Malott and Jack Michael and Roger. And he's just thought, he says, well, you should work on our project here. I'll show you where you could have a desk. He takes me downstairs in Thompson Hall. And here's a free desk, but just to the left of it is the desk with a beautiful young <laughs> graduate student there. And I see Jill and I say, yeah, this is cool. I'm a <laughs> I want to work in this project. Uh, so that's how I ended up at UMass. Oh, great story. And the first time, you know, Jill and I met. So this is now the fall of 1971. Are you looking for a new job, but you're overwhelmed with all the emails that you're getting from various ABA agencies? What if there was someone who was in your corner and could help you find the perfect job placement? Well, that person exists. Barbara Voss has been working as a recruiter for over 30 years, and her company, HRIC, specializes in placing BCBAs in permanent full-time positions throughout the United States. Barbara has been placing BCBAs since 2011, so she knows our business, and she offers personalized service to any BCBA looking for a new position. She also helps companies looking to hire BCBAs, too. Here are just some of the things Barbara can help you with. She can provide information about salary ranges in different markets across the country. She can help you write your resume. She can coordinate and prepare you for the interview process and even help negotiate the right salary for you. And best of all, there are no charges to any candidate for all of these services. When you are ready to make a change and want to work with someone who will listen to you and understand what you need in a new position, contact Barbara at HRIC. To schedule a confidential discussion, head over to hricolorado.com. Again, that's hricolorado.com and hit the contact button to connect with Barbara. You won't be disappointed. You know, that's 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 what I, I continue to ask the question about how people get into this field because it's always it always yields a very interesting story. So I appreciate you guys walking us through that so uh obviously a, a lot's happened between 1971 and where we are right now uh and, and so um i uh, uh I, i'd like to hear a little bit more about how you got into or not how you got into obviously you're into behavior analysis at this point certainly but um what 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 were some of the maybe some early experiences that you guys had as uh, either as uh, graduate students or practitioners and um, 
cer- certainly let's talk about perhaps some of the earlier iterations of the of the work that ultimately made its way into let's make a contract yeah well while we were in grad school we had the opportunity to actually help found an early intervention project in western mass it was a project for kids ages um, three to eight. And at that time, this is before um, the Education for All Students with Disabilities Act was passed. It was, that was several years down, down the road. And um, schools and programs were allowed to basically kick kids out. If they found them too disruptive, unteachable, they would give them a label such as that, you know, take your kid home, have a nice day. <laughs> So this project, Project Change, um, was designed to work with kids who had been kicked out of a bunch of programs and deemed kind of incorrigible, unteachable. And the idea was to change their behavior to a point where they could be reintegrated into a typical school type setting. Um, Bill was the head teacher and I was the parent educator. And we sort of had to develop these jobs as we went along, but we we were and the uh, other people in the project were all behaviorally oriented. So we were all at least on the same page with that. Um, So the kids, it was actually a half day program. The kids were there until about noon or so. And then um, in the afternoons, I was the parent educator. So I would do home visits to the the families uh, and help them carry out some programs in the home setting. And then in the evenings, I would do parent group meetings, a small group of parents, maybe um, six or eight parents maximum, and teach them the principles of behavior and how they could work with their kids using these techniques. Um, And that was fantastic because for, for many reasons, for one thing, the group of parents I worked with was very diverse age wise, um, Education-wise, some were barely high school grads. Some had graduate degrees. Um, some of them actually were referred through the court system, and they were in danger of losing their kids if they didn't comply with our program's uh, regulations. So um, I would do that. As I mentioned, in the evenings, I'd visit them in the afternoons in their homes. And I was absolutely amazed at how quickly the parents picked up the principles and techniques that I was teaching. They made so much sense to them. They um, found that they were very successful in moving their kids in a positive direction in many areas of of, um, their existence. And I felt so good about this that I sort of went the next step and thought, well, this should be available to other parents, other families, not just the ones who are in this program. What would be a way of reaching out to more families in a cost-effective way? where their child didn't necessarily have to be in a program, but what kind of materials, what what could we do to help facilitate families working with their kids in positive ways? Um, Contracting was one thing the parents I worked with loved and were very successful at. And I started thinking about um, maybe a children's book, telling a story about a family that used contracts for different reasons. What if I wrote a book that taught parents through stories and their children how to do contracting in the home. That would be very cost effective. And I told the idea to Bill. He loved it and was on board. We decided we'd do this together. And um, did you want to add anything to that? We, we started looking for a publisher. Well, and uh, here Western Michigan comes back to in, into play. Um, Dick Millot and Don Whaley at, had just recently uh, started a, a publishing company they called Behavior Delia. Mm-hmm. And they were using some novel ways to teach the principles of, of behavior. Um, and uh, one of their most uh, kind of famous and well known books, is Joe's pulling it off the shelf here, is called uh, Captain Conman Contingency Management. Um, what does this say? The education in- and other equally <laughs> exciting places. Yeah, and it's so a, it's it's a basically you know it's comic book comic book to teach ABA. Yeah, it's I mean, just, nobody was doing that all ABA. So it, you know it was typical textbook format, and this is what he and uh, Don Whaley came up with. So we thought they're telling the story, they're teaching in a different way. Maybe they would be interested in our, a proposal that we had put together for a book we were going to call Sign Here, a contracting book for children and their parents. So here it is. 
this is actually a, a second edition in 81. So what, um, you know, what happened is Jill said is uh, there's were contracts there and um, some really neat uh, illustrations written about the fourth grade level. So the idea is parents could read it with their children. Mm -hmm. uh, some children with the reading skills, older kids could read the stories by themselves. Right. And the back end of the book, we called it the uh, family's, you know, contracting kit and how, how to develop contracts. And, um, and also we put in the forms and these are perforated. Parents could actually just tear them out. Yeah. Okay. So, and, and use a contracting form with their families. So the, the, the book was first published in, um, in 76. And at the time, um, highlights for children was, and still is a, a, a big thing, a, 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 you know, a magazine a oh, yeah. like for, for young was, children. Yeah. And it just so happened that Walter Barb, the editor of highlights for children, the editor in chief, editor in chief, and actually highlights is located in Columbus, their, their business and editorial offices. And Dr. Barb was teaching as an adjunct uh, in our special ed program at OSU. So I'd gotten to know him from that. And uh, he was really supportive. Um, he wrote the forward to the book and, it, you know, got out there. It got some reviews. But importantly, um, three Ph.D. dissertations at OSU were done to really do some R&D on this method of developing contracts that we had where families would fill out a series of uh, three forms called my tasks, your tasks, and then uh, some ideas for things you might want as rewards. And um, one of the studies was done with uh, three fourth grade teachers and all of their students. And they use the sign here book with the fourth graders to learn contracting as a self-management technique. The other two that were done in 77 um, were with parent uh, groups, um, parents of children with uh, behavior challenges and problems that had signed up for these free six-week parenting programs that graduate students in a course I was teaching on working with families and parents um, for future special ed teachers and future behavior analysts, they would teach these uh, workshops all, all over the Columbus some uh, some semesters, we'd have 300 parents involved in groups of six or eight. Um, and so many of them used the sign here book with those parents. And so two of those studies were done with uh, some really good results. We took the um, what we learned from that and developed a leader's manual that Be Behavior Dealer published uh, in 77 for people running uh, parent education groups could use that with suggestions on how to organize your sessions. Um, it could also be used then by teachers in schools. Okay, a couple of years later, Behavior Delia goes out of business. They sold Sign Here, our title, to a small company in Connecticut um, that uh, incorporated the leader's manual info and into, and this was their second uh, edition that they published. Um, Throughout 1992, Jill and I get two boxes uh, on the step, and, uh, and it was about 50 books of the inventory. That company went out of business with a letter, and they returned all the rights to sign here to us. And, and you know, we thought, well, that it was cool. It was fun. But that's that. But that's that. And we're all into a zillion other things, you know, raising kids and trying to be faculty members in our own <laughs> So about 2015, I'm at a conference, uh, an ABA and autism conference in Bucharest, uh, Romania. And the group that was organizing it, the, the kind of pioneer behavior analyst there and uh, the, the mother of a young boy with autism whom she, who she had really helped or talking with them after the conference. And they had put together a parents organization uh, in Romania of about 300 families, and they were just talking about how they could disseminate uh, the science um, and these uh, teaching strategies to families. Uh, Bucharest is one big city, but Romania is a very large country, a lot of small towns, villages. And we're talking, and I remembered the sign here. Told them a little bit about it, and they said, we think that we need it. Jill and I sent them a copy. We said, if, you, if it'd be of any use to you, 
here it is. They said, could we translate it? We said, well, of course. <laughs> a year later, this is signed here in Romanian. And a year later, they invited Jill and I back to uh, another conference in Bucharest. And uh, we got to be there and do a little talk on contracting for families. And the 400 people in attendance got, got free copies of sign here. Well, we're thinking, Jesus, <laughs> maybe some other people would be interested. So this is sign here in Russian. This is sign here in Italian. This is sign here in the Czech language. Mm. This is Chinese sign here. It's just published last November by a, um, a university press in Guangzhou, China. You probably already know that Behavior University creates engaging ABA content for new and experienced professionals. Whether it's RBT training or webinars for BACB CEUs, Behavior University has you covered. Behavior University is launching an interactive BACB supervisor training, an innovative approach to supervision training with interactive video to practice decision making and tools to create a personalized portfolio to take with you when you're done. The course is designed to guide new supervisors through applying the important skills required for effective supervision to their own unique experiences. Behavior University also offers two tiers of RBT training. Choose the essentials for the 40-hour course or the premium to add a full kit of study materials and, full, and a full-length practice exam. In addition to these features, supervisors can now purchase access to these RBT courses so they can monitor any RBT training for course progress and quiz performance. Supervisors will also receive tools and content to support training of new staff. Users rave about Behavior University RBT training, calling it the clearest instruction, the course that made it stick, amongst other condoms. BCBA say that their staff clearly get it after taking their course. So to check out what they've built and to get podcast-specific discounts, head on over to behavioruniversity.com forward slash observations. So sign here will be published this summer in Japanese and in Filipino, which will make 10 languages. Wow. So about a year ago, Jill and I are saying the way this is going, English will be the only language that our book is available in. And so we thought we really ought to, you know, you know, update it. Let's see if we can find a publisher interested in uh, uh, in working with us. And um, we found this publisher, Collective Book Studio, and tell they, about well, the, they um, matched us up with a wonderful yeah. developmental editor named Elizabeth Dowardy. She's absolutely fabulous. We thought initially we would just. Take sign here, kind of like dust it off, <laughs> update a little. Anytime there was a landline, we put a cell phone in there. <laughs> you, know, be, you know, not a big deal. <laughs> However, this editor had us completely deconstruct the book and then reconstruct it in a completely different way. The principles are the same. But for example, instead of what, one family, the, oh, you get the yeah. Kruger bags. <laughs> yeah. Instead of one family, we now have four families. Four very diverse families. Okay. Um, two of the families have kids with autism, and the kids range range in age from four to fourteen in the story. So now we have nine stories about four different families, and the idea is that well, this is when she made us deconstruct everything. These are okay. cold shopping bags we cut and out. All the yarn connects different. <laughs> stories okay. All right. So I'm going to have to narrate this a little bit for the because most people yeah, okay. are listening to this. So what? <laughs> So describe what you're holding up, uh, if you don't mind. We did a, a cut and paste, basically, of the original sign here. We added all kinds of things. We moved things around. We There's yarn connecting a lot of these little cut, cut and paste. I, you know, people don't think of it as actually cutting and pasting. <laughs> right, That's right. what we did, you know, right. it's more a computer. All right. So for, the, so, for, for the, Jill, if you know, if, so for the listeners, it's a big, uh, I don't know, it looks like at least uh, five by five foot uh, uh, um, uh, uh, paper that looks like it's made up of shopping bags uh, with all sorts of uh, cutouts from uh, yeah. various paragraphs little, and things like con- that. Little contracts, little lists. Yeah, yeah. It, it um, kind of, you know what that reminds me? It reminds me of like in like the detective shows where like the detective has like all the all the clues on the board 
That's you know, with, right. with the, with the push, with the push, the push pins and the yarn and stuff like that. So uh, forgive well, me for interrupting. Can, I just want to make sure folks were, yeah. were un- yeah. understood what was, uh, what you guys were, were, were showing. Well, we so. have, with our, our, the new book, let's make a contract. We have a vastly improved uh, set of stories that should appeal to a much wider or audience where people can relate to different, different families and different um, home situations. And so uh, the basic, contracting system is the same and that's what the research is based on but it's completely updated modernized and yeah uh, and and your publisher was kind of to send me a copy of it i looked through it it's it's, it's really really slick it, it looks really nice i want to ask and i want to get into the, the actual basics of contracting here in just a second but i can't help but ask so sign here has all this momentum behind it and all these iterations of, of not just editions, but also other languages and things like that. Did you guys have a hard time letting go of that and, and tearing it apart and putting it back together? Or can you describe, was that, was that a challenge from your perspective? I can imagine if I, I'm just trying to put myself in your shoes, I'd be like, ah, well, I have this thing. It works. Everyone <laughs> loves it. Yeah. Uh, and you're asking me to basically start yeah, from yeah, not start right. from scratch, but essentially yeah. like really uh, tear it down and build it back up again. Got, got um, yeah. Well, you know, yeah. initially we were sort of reluctant. I mean, we are retired. And <laughs> we thought this would be a little tweakage here and there. But once this editor, who's very experienced in working with uh, children's book authors and other authors in the field of education, she really explained the rationale of why we needed to do a complete overhaul. We call it a gut renovation of the book. It doesn't, it in many ways, doesn't even look like the first book. Wouldn't you agree? Right. doesn't look like it. But several of the stories from the original are, are here. Are here. Um, and the, the, the book does, we hope it does what we the, the first book does is to show families that here's this uh, this tool that uh, not always but often can can really help a, help a family uh, deal with behavior challenges uh, learn new skills and do it in a way that's collaborative between uh, you know parents and kids it's not you're going to do this and mm-hmm. um and um and it has that, as Jill said, kind of we think of it as the sign here contracting system that had this initial research behind it um, and all of the uh, successes that families have had uh, cross-culturally with applying it. Um, but in one way, you know, sign here is still alive because those translations uh, are out there and available. Mm-hmm. Interestingly, um, We've already licensed uh, translations of the new book in 10 languages. And four of those languages are people that did the original sign here and I want, want, to, want to publish the, uh, the new version. But just last week, of, in all places, I was in Baku, Azerbaijan. And the first <laughs> translation of let's make a contract by this NGO, it's a, it's a group of, uh, of, of parents who developed a, a school and a program for, for children with autism and developmental disabilities. Uh, so they have a big center-based impressive program based on the Princeton Child Development uh, Institute. And it's a lot of activity schedules. So they're a model program. It's fabulous. Uh, and they're reaching out into schools and uh, to help teachers and families. So for this, uh, they were able to obtain, um, uh, you know, donations. The little seal on the front is a, a printer in Baku, the capital city, that donated and printed all the copies. So these are being, you know, given away for free to families and uh, and teachers uh, in, in Azerbaijan. Yeah. yeah. So that's our motivation. We'd like yeah, to get this out yeah. to families who could use it. And um, one thing we've done, we're doing in the process of doing to facilitate this is this book does not, it has all the contract forms in the back, as I'm sure you know this, um, but they're not perforated. So we are in the process of putting together a website where readers of the book, or really anyone, it's a free website, could go on the website and download any forms that they would like to print and use. So we're making it more more user friendly in this era of technology so that really any family could easily 
print download and print some of the forms in, in a dozen languages and uh, and, and counting. Yeah, all the languages uh, will be in there, and again, it will be free. The um, um, Javier Ortega and Abba Espana are nearly finished with um, uh, a translation that they expect to, to publish this spring, possibly in time for ABAI in Boston. Okay, uh, in uh, Brazilian Portuguese, it's nearly finished. Uh, yesterday, Jill and I met with um, a behavior analyst and just so happens a, a mom with a child with autism in Nice, France. And uh, her company had just finished a, trans a French translation of the white book. And now she's nearing completion of let's make a contract. So it's just, it's, yeah. it, it's, it's amazing. Well, um, we think one, one of the main attractions is that we're explaining contracting in the context of stories. And stories are meaningful to people. People yeah. relate to stories and people tend to remember stories rather than a list of steps in a procedure, when they read about something in context, I think they're more engaged and more likely to actually try some of the techniques in, at home. And we're also thrilled that this research-based um, contracting system can be put in the hands of many people at very low cost. Correct. And as, yep. as Bill mentioned, free, many of the, the NGOs or parent organizations are not charging parents anything. They're just giving them out and they, they get funding for this. So, you know, we're, we're thrilled that we're reaching the end user. That That's really our goal. Wow. Reaching them in plain language and story format in a very usable material. I guess to put our effort with both sign here and now the new book is that it's our, it's our best effort to translate the science uh, for society. And in this case, uh, to parents, Mm -hmm. uh, and, and families and to take a real evidence-based uh, intervention that at its heart uh, is an application of, re, you know, positive reinforcement. Uh, that's the, that's mm -hmm. the key principle at, at, at work. And of course, there's prompting things with the info that's on the contract and we include a task record. So the family, often the child themselves can keep a record. So that it does incorporate data collection if you want to do that. But Try to do it in a way that, as Jill said, is first, um, you know, it looks interesting. Hey, this is doable. Uh, why not, you know, why not give it a try? And then present it in such a way that, you know, families, um, if, if they sit down, kind of take a shot at going through this process and discussing things like, what are you doing well right now to help the family? But what are some other things you might do? to be a, a more positive family member and meet your goals. And then mm -hmm. our, our, our second uh, kind of list is called um, your tasks. And it's the same thing. It's two columns. It begins with what this person is doing well now to help the family and what, what they could do different. But this form is filled out for everybody, parents and kids, but by everybody else in the family. So okay, grandma, so, and grandpa live in there. so now this gives the way it's set up, it gives parents an opportunity. And we say, before you start writing all the things you want your kid to do differently or better or to stop doing, take a moment and write down, oh, you've got to write on the left, it gives them an opportunity to recognize here are positive things a child is doing now. And the kids fill out this form you know, on their They're parents. Yeah. So, yeah. And then, so, and it's, so it's often just a real eye opener and okay, so, even so, if contracts so. don't result uh, as an outcome of this, it's an opportunity for the family to uh, have kind of a, you know, a supportive uh, discussion that's not just parents again, telling the kids all the things they are doing wrong. Okay, so if we were to go through the elements of the contracting process, you know, so we can kind of transition in, you know, from yeah. the historical of how we got to here into the the content of the book, um, so would you consider that the first step in the process of basically uh, going through that uh, that that T chart that you just described? We could do, you know, families don't have to do this formal. Process. Yeah. They they can if you you've probably read the stories, you know, they can see identify a problem. Mm -hmm. Define the problem, put it in the form of a task, come up with an appropriate reward, 
and then start re recording the tasks. So it can be a kind of a simple process. But one thing I wanted to mention before, and we make this point in the book and when we talk about this, we're not saying this is a panacea. We're not, we're not saying that every behavior would be improved using a contracting format. We're saying, you know, pick and, this is helpful for a lot of things, but not for everything. So you as a family have to decide if this would apply to the behaviors that you're working on. Mm -hmm. We okay. also show in the book a lot of variations, not just a written contract. A lot of kids don't read and write. We show picture contracts that uh, can be used illustrations or, or photographs. And um, we use visual activity yeah, schedules. Visual consent. activity schedules kind of integrated into a contract. We make the point that contracts are not forever. They're something that you, you use to get things going in a positive direction. You start fading it out. Okay. So all of this information is actually in the second part of the book. The how to for parents. So yes. Yeah, so nine stories, and then we get to the how to. You know, balancing work and life can be difficult. And that's why the University of Cincinnati Online designed a Master's of Education in Behavior Analysis program that's 100% online and asynchronous, which means you can log on when it works for you. Their student success coordinators will work with you from the start all the way through your graduation to ensure you are receiving the support you need. Graduate in as few as five semesters from a top 10 program and total number of graduates and prepare for the BCBA exam. The program is FAFSA eligible and UC also offers a business partnership program to offer tuition discounts to eligible employees. If you want to learn more, go to online.uc edu and click the request info button again that's online.uc.edu all right let's get back to this interview so uh I'd, I'd like to get into kind of the boundary conditions of when a contracting intervention isn't isn't appropriate um but i i you, we we went through the elements of a contract uh, uh pretty quickly but I, I i know there's a lot of behavior analysts especially those in, uh, you know, when you go through the core sequences, particularly these days, you, you know, you kind of get right into things like functional communication training, you know, all these, you know, <laughs> very, very high tech, high touch stuff. Yep, yep. Um, so I would love, uh, so Jill, you just very, very efficiently went through all those steps, but I think it's it might be important for those who don't have a background in this to, to maybe uh, go into some of those steps in a, in a little bit more detail. So, uh, and, and, and perhaps maybe tagging this per, perhaps to a, uh, you know, what are some specific challenging behaviors that you've seen this process work well with? So maybe we can kind of arrange our understanding of, of these strategies or uh, on on a, on a particular repertoire or, or, or of uh, as a framework, if you will. Well, first, I sort of rule out the use of contracts with very young children. It doesn't necessarily make sense to do a contract with a child under the age of maybe four, three or four. Mm -hmm. um, also, if the child has self injurious behaviors, self stem that sort of thing, I don't see that this would be an appropriate technique. So I guess I'm thinking more in terms of what wouldn't work. What it would work for are kind of typical family problems, not just for, for kids who have a disability, autism or other disabilities, but kids who have trouble completing their homework, cleaning up their rooms when necessary, um, eating appropriately, getting ready for school in the morning, going to bed at night without a fuss, really kind of typical family problems that are not extremely intense, where you really would need a professional to intervene and, and put together a very structured program mm -hmm. so that parents mm -hmm. could work on. Mm -hmm. Did you want to add? No, I just, uh, I was thinking of, as Joe was, uh, was talking, thinking about what, you know, one of the stories uh, in, in the book is called The Pet Menace. Mm -hmm. And it's four-year-old Maya, uh, a child you know, with autism, and uh, she's got this thing going where she's rough on the family pets. She pulls the dog's ear and tail and she gets over with the aquarium and she's dropping her building blocks in on, on the fish. And uh, 
you know, most, most likely we don't get into a um, functional analysis or anything like that, but it's kind of a, a you know, attention motivated is kind of suggested by what, you know, what happens. And, you know, she keeps doing this and the, all of a sudden mom and dad are saying, you know, we're just going to have to get rid of the pets. We don't know. And she's got an older sister um, who's in the same fourth grade class as a couple of the other kids in the previous stories in the book. Uh, and she's heard that they're using contracts. Um, uh, Jeff uh, is out of contract with his dad to clean up his room. And that all started because he was waking dad up who works at night. And, and then uh, Jeff's buddy, Perry, uh, wants to do better with uh, mathematics fractions. He wants to be a game engineer like his mom. And so he develops actually a self-contract and kind of the second story to, to focus on, uh, not just studying math, but they kind of get that contract sorted out where he's actually solving 10 problems each night before he gets to play video games. And that, that contract really is the uh, uh, switching uh, what he had done before, watch TV, you know, what play video games instead of doing. So in, in these stories, and the same thing will happen in Maya's contract with the pets, the family makes real typical mistakes that we all make in developing programs uh, and reinforcement based programs. Um, And in the first contract, it's not specifying the task well enough. So Jeff thinks he did everything. I met the contract. I cleaned up my room. It was a lot better, but dad said, look, your desk is still a mess. And so that story goes into, all right, let's sit down. Let's revise the contract. They're not set in stone once they're, you know, it's a kind of a living yeah, that's we want to communicate that to parents that yeah. you you know do the best you can to to try a, a contract. If it's not working, then let's look at it. Maybe your behavior isn't specified appropriately. Maybe the reward really isn't rewarding to the child. Yeah. Maybe there's too big of a gap between when the child does the task and the reward. Yeah. So we want them to kind of, you know problem solve. This isn't magic. It's work. You yeah. know, yeah. but parents are motivated to help their kids. And they love their kids. And so a lot of parents are willing to put the work in to, to try something different and something positive. Yeah. Um, a lot of the families get stuck in a very negative um, situation, punishment and yelling and negative. threatening and everything. So we're just giving them another option of something to try. It's not going to be successful in every case. But as you know, we're saying, parents can work on it and try to make it better. And at the very least, at least they'll be more we hope communication between the parent and the child about what's going on in their lives. So back to Maya, her older sister, Martina says, Oh, please. We got, we love the pets. We got to keep them. And she tells mom and dad about it, her, her friends at school. They, they're using contracts at home. Maybe we could do a contract with Maya. And mom and dad says, Maya's only four and she doesn't read. How can we do that? She says, well, who says the contract has to be in words. Let's use pictures. And so they find a picture of a a dog food commercial in a magazine of this girl petting a dog nicely. They put that on the left side of a paper. And uh, Martina, the older sister, likes to draw. And she just draws a simple picture of a goldfish bowl and a girl looking at the fish nicely. So this contract, you know, exemplifies the, the importance of replacement behaviors and not just say, well, don't. It's a don't pull the dog's ear and don't. Here's what we want you to do. And then they model that and they role play it. Um, And then, as Jill said, the mistake made in this contract was that Maya needed to do those behaviors for that hour or so, hour and a half. And she came home from daycare with mom who brings her home from work. And then another hour or so after dinner before bedtime. And then somebody she was supposed to get a reward, which is somebody reading her a story, which she loved. Yeah. But it was just too big of a gap. So she made it through to dinner the first night. And then after dinner, she creeps closer and closer. And finally, she's back dropping things in the fishbowl. And there they revised the contract. You know, we just it's this thing. Well, reinforcement doesn't work. Well, we've got this baseline performance. And then we expect magic. We put in this uh, reinforcement space contingency and it's going to solve all our problems. So they cut the time in half. Somebody reads her a story while the table's being set. She makes an hour before, an hour after. And then that 
and they make more of an effort to, to talk to her and praise her when she's doing whatever she's doing, playing with her toys and not bothering the pets. So again, we try to put in a lot of different positive strategies that parents could try. It, and throughout, there's no behavior analysis terminology or jargon. Right. Um, awesome. In the back, as you've seen, there's resources, and we refer to applied behavior analysis as the science that underlies mm-hmm. um, the contracting approach and provide um, some uh, resources and references where you can go to there. We do have a behavior, we introduce a behavior analyst um, in one of the last stories about um, a young boy with autism who wants to make friends at school. He's a little sad that he uh, doesn't have friends. And so the behavior analyst, the mom who she's been working with and the, and the teacher meet, and it shows a collaboration. And in that story, it's a homeschool contract where the task is going up and introducing himself and starting conversations at, with classmates, classmates, he meets with the teacher before he goes home. She gives the note to mom, takes it home. Mom provides, you know, the praise and he likes the Legos. He gets little Lego characters and these and so forth. All of these stories are based on, uh, incorporate, you know, there's peer mediated intervention in the one where he practices with it. The, there's the homeschool uh, collaboration stuff. There's the effective use of adult attention and praise. Uh, there's behavioral prompts, rehearsal. behavioral rehearsal, there's modeling. All of those things are built in, but they're not presented in, uh, in, in technical terms. So when we, we introduce the behavior analyst, we say, Krista, a behavior analyst who, who helps kids with their behavior. Uh, that's in the story. Huh? Short and sweet. Yeah. Yeah. I like it. Now in the back, it says, well, what's a behavior analyst? And we say in the little glossary, well, that's somebody with a graduate training and certification. And if you'd like to learn more, we have the BAC, BACB's uh, website link. Right. Um, right. But you don't, you don't need any uh, prior, uh, you know, knowledge or experience with ABA. Um, oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's written super accessibly. So you guys did a really, really nice job with that for sure. I, I One thing occurred to me as we're chatting here and that's, uh, and, and maybe this is applicable to sign here as well as let's make a contract. Uh, but have you guys had any pushback from the, uh, you know, the, the alpha cone, you know, punished by rewards types? Uh, you know, oh, kids don't need extrinsic rewards, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and if so, uh, how have you respond to that? Well, we might get it with the new book if it makes enough of a splash for uh, Alfie Cohn and others to recognize. You know, sign here, frankly, is so much uh, uh, under the radar. Okay. Uh, that, that no, I don't recall that specifically to, uh, you know, to our. Uh, to our contracting books, but, but, but of course that's a, yeah, that's I a mean, theme that I guess taking it beyond the, the, the actual persona of yeah. that particular critic of, of, of perhaps behavior analysis writ large. Uh, but just, you know, obviously that's, that's a, a piece of pushback that sometimes uh, gets thrown around when people are brainstorming about particular solutions to, yeah. to, to challenges of, of behavior, you know, uh, um, so I was just curious more generally. So yeah, it, it sounds like given the, the, the way in which, and, and particularly internationally, so that, uh, you know, people have kind of respond to these strategies very positively. And I'm just, you know, especially, uh, I'm just curious if there's, if there's been uh, any, any type of critique or, uh, or hesitation, pushback, uh, et cetera, relative to yeah. Yeah, we have arranging external that. rewards. Okay, great. Yeah. That's great news. Yeah. Um, but of course, you know, you've hit on something that's just still alive as as, as ever is. Uh, oh, yeah. yeah. Cone and others, you know, reinforcement's bad and you don't do punish by rewards and, yeah. and and so on. Are we able, Matt, to provide some related readings and materials that could be that you would link with this? Yeah, absolutely. So you can send me anything you like and I will make sure it goes in the show notes for the episode. And oh, it's right. just uh, your, your question about uh, the, you know, rewards are bad, not all of that. There was a wonderful article by Phil Strain and somebody else in a major um, you know, magazine for early childhood people. It's called Young Children. 
And the title of it is something, I've got a PDF on a machine, I'll, I'll send it to you, but it's something like, uh, you know, not so good with good, and it, it was a retort uh, to Alfie Cohn. Okay. He had published in another huge, um, like the, the National Association of the Education of Young Children. Uh, and they do the developmentally appropriate practice, which sometimes bumps up against uh, what um, behavioral early intervention people are doing. But most of the time it bumps up because it's two ships passing in the night and not good communication related to, you know, what behaviors are targeted for, for change. Um, but in his, uh, this initial paper, Cone, I'll send the link to that too. He says five reasons not to tell kids good job. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and then strain and his, his co-author just did a beautiful, you know, response to that. Okay. And explained how important and powerful it is, um, the, the, the adult attention and prayer. Oh, and another one we've got to include. Um, Todd Risley's memorial article in JABA. Memorial? Wolf. Wolf. Up, about, Montrose. about Montrose Wolf. There is a an extract, a quote in there that I just love. I'll send that along too, but... He talks about just the power of these early experiments, mostly in preschools, um, by Montrose Wolf and his colleagues um, in, uh, in the early 60s, and just a remarkable change of, in children's behavior. And he said it was something so simple and ubiquitous as adult praise and attention. And he goes on to say this is arguably the most the biggest finding in American psychology ever. And it's the, it's what runs through really all effective is positive reinforcement, differential mm. reinforcement done well. Um, okay. Yeah. Well, that's a good, it's really the foundation of everything that we're trying to do as, uh, as teachers and as behavior analysts, whether doing home-based center-based school-based community work. Um, but we're also, we're, we're not, like shoving this down anybody's throat. If a parent reads this, they read the stories, they understand it's research-based, science-based, although that doesn't necessarily persuade a lot of people these days. Um, but if there are, we give so many examples, yeah. it's all positive. It's not, but if they don't feel comfortable with that, then don't do, you know, do do whatever you're doing. You know, we, right. we can't reach out to their homes. We're just offering a positive science-based option yeah, for yeah, people. Yeah. And so they'll there probably will be critics. I don't know. Okay. We'll Actually, Matt, I have that uh Risley. It's in the it's in the book on page 197. We just have a little section in the resources called the effects of praise on children's behavior. Yeah. Um wonderful. And yes. Kind of back to, even if you didn't do a contract, if you kind of talked. And uh, and interacted in a in a positive way. Hopefully, that will come through. Um, Great. So that's a good uh, cue for folks to check out the show notes of this episode. You can go to behavioralobservations.com. and also those show notes go out to the mailing list. So if you're on the website, sign up for the mailing list where I send the show notes out for every episode. And uh, so thank you for giving me that opportunity to, to share that certainly. And um, so I, I want to talk about reinforcers for a minute. And uh, I, I, so I talk to a lot of, most of my work is school-based uh, mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm working with, uh, w w with kids who have challenging behaviors in school settings. And part of that work, involves me getting on the phone or getting on a, you know, a zoom or a Google meet or whatever with parents and just kind of learning more about the kids. And the pattern that I'm seeing is that the, the default is for kids to be in reinforcement you know, a lot of times. Uh, and, and, and so I, I'd like to get your perspective on kind of like a, you know, the 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 access to reinforcement that seems to be increasingly ubiquitous these days, uh, and I don't know if that's a fair generalization or not. Uh, I'd love to get your take on that. But if you think of things, uh, especially screen based activities like uh, mm -hmm. you know video games uh, that are you know 
they're being designed by by behavioral scientists who understand variable uh-huh. you know variable schedules very very well and, and uh, same thing with YouTube you know YouTube just serves up stuff that you just happen to be interested in. <laughs> It's yeah, like magic, Isn't that interesting? right? Yeah. Uh, it just happens. They know I like to make you know, beer. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. And uh, you know, and so there's a lot of behavioral science working against or competing with our attention and things like that. And so I, I, I kind of think of this as kind of closed versus open economies, and 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 moving it forward also into things like smartphones, where you know, I know we joked around on email about this before our chat here but uh you know i have three teenagers and they each have iphones and they're always you know they're 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 with them all the time you know so it's not like you know okay you're you're gonna do your your math homework and then and then you know i'm gonna give you your you know your iphone i mean i suppose i could do that i'm not looking for specific advice on uh, you know uh um with, with, with my family per se uh that would be a much longer uh, uh podcast but i'm just kidding uh but I wonder if you could just maybe comment on this on this more generally. You know, uh, at, at a certain point, I, I, I look at least when I'm talking to families, I, I have to kind of shift them over to that closed economy mindset in terms of like, you, well, you you can't just do that. You can't just, you know. But it's yeah. it's well, so well, hard. Know, yeah. When we were young, we 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 grew up in different environments. I was in the city. He was in the country. We had a few toys. We didn't have a million toys and things. Now kids have Every, tons of stuff, tons of toys and pads and tablets. And and honestly, you know, we're grandparents. We're kind of guilty of that, too. We have a ton of stuff around our house for grandkids to play with. And grandparents, people give them toys. You know, they just they have so much stuff. They're drowning in stuff. So it's very hard to suddenly start taking away the stuff and making kids earn the stuff through a contract or other system. What I would suggest is as early as possible for parents to start using activity rewards, not tangible stuff and computer-based stuff. Um, It can be very simple as it could be, uh, you know, a walk around the block and doing a little scavenger hunt with your mom or dad or going to the park for a picnic lunch or going to the zoo, if you know, if you like that type of activity. So the first, the first contract in in the first story here with Jeff and his room cleaning is special time with Dad on Saturday, and there's a little menu that they develop. They could go visit the zoo. They could go to the batting cage. Yeah. He could bring a friend, uh, you know. And as Jill said, to, you don't want to start off with a contract by taking away things that the child's already Has experiencing. You know, as a, as a free range right, child in, right. in the house, right? Mm. But but activity reinforcers with a parent also have the built in advantage of developing the parent child relationship in a positive way. So that's what I would suggest. And again, start as early as possible so kids really start looking forward to doing something with mom or dad as a reward for the task on their contract. But um, it, it's hard. I've seen a, a couple of parents who rotate the toys, which is probably a really good idea. So the kid doesn't have a thousand toys. I'll have, you know, 15 at a time. <laughs> and the next week, another 15 will come in. So if kids are used to that, that's, that's kind of a good thing. But again, I would, I would recommend activity reinforcers, mm-hmm. low cost. Very good. And, and, and uh, what if you're encountering a, a situation where the, you know, that, that history hasn't been developed uh, and it, but you know, it, it, but nonetheless, behavior change is an objective that that is uh, that is important to achieve. You know, what, what what would your advice be? So the parent hasn't, you know, maybe developed this activity, uh, you know, time, uh, you know, as a reinforcer, and you have a, a fairly unfettered access, let's say, to you know some of these other reinforcers that we've described. Who, which I don't want, I'm just kind of I'm maybe brainstorming out loud here, perhaps as opposed yeah. to asking a specific question, but would you, would you, you know, uh, would you recommend some sort of process of uh, fading one out and one in, or, you know, how, how would you advise that, uh, or that, uh, that caregiver? Mm-hmm. I, I would think choice should figure into this. Yeah. 
Um, we have shown in a couple of contracts, you can do a menu of reinforcers. So if you know what your child is interested in, you might give him or her a choice of activities rather than say, this is going to be it. So that might be one way to, to start the process of enjoying an activity with your parent, especially if the child can pick, okay, I want to do this or I want to do this. Do you have an idea? Well, I just think in terms of the mom or dad fading, you know, bringing themselves into the activities that their child's already doing and enjoying and mm. much easier to do when you start with a toddler and a preschooler, more of a challenge with a 17 year old who Get out of here, Dad. Yeah, they want the opposite. They want they, they would yeah, want to get yeah. the parents away from them. So right. I can speak maybe, to per, maybe that, personal maybe experience that with the that. Reward on that. That's right. Yeah, it's interesting. One of our I- examples that we remember from a real family was uh, with a dad filling out his my rewards thing. Is one of them is uh, sitting in my chair with nobody bothering me for half an hour. Oh, man. You know, those those kinds of things. But so you know, maybe mom or dad just. It, the, the, the teenager allows them to play the video game with them. And you start to have this, these opportunities to pair yourself with act with activities, with things that are currently reinforcing for the child and maybe start to acquire a bit of a reinforcing value uh, yourself, you know, and Joe mentioned choice. That's a big thing. A lot of kids, just the idea of accomplishing something new, uh, it can be a pretty powerful reinforcer as well. And that's where the task record, and we could, one of our suggestions for the final chapter in the book is some ideas. Well, what if you do all of this and your child says, I don't want to do a contract. You know, I'm not doing this. And one option we suggest is a self-contract where actually the child is in charge of deciding, did I do the task? And they deliver the reward themselves. And that kind of fits into this you know, free range and say open economy thing. I've got access to these things, but I'm going to set up a a goal for myself and keep the task record and see if I can do that. And that's what's modeled in the um, in the second story, the contract that uh, Perry makes with himself to try to do better um, with with fractions uh, at school, where. He says, all right, I'm going to hold off on, I'm usually playing video games, but I really do, I do want to do better in math. So let me spend a half hour studying and then I can watch my. That's interesting. You know, there's, there's a paper, uh, this topic's been becoming more of a discussion in terms of kind of like uh, the, on a preference for contingent access to, to reinforcers as opposed mm-hmm. to non-contingent access. And there's a, uh, there's a paper on that, I believe, in the latest Java that I haven't read yet. But uh, yeah, so that that's that's interesting. Seems to tie into yeah, that. And I think I think Greg Hanley might have done some. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Holly Gover is the lead art, lead author, who is uh, one of Greg's students. Um, mm-hmm. So you're absolutely right. So, uh, so let's let's talk a little bit about the research uh, behind contracting. Uh, you certainly cite some examples in the book. Uh, I, I'm curious if I'm a grad student right now, yeah, or, or, or let me just back up the question a little bit and ask it more directly, I suppose. What, what, what are some important, are, are, are there more important questions to suss out in terms of, uh, you know, from a research perspective on, uh, on the use of contracts? Do we, do we, do we know enough about it? Um, or, or is there more work to be done from a research? Well, you know, we don't, and, we don't- we don't know enough about anything. So, well, I know. I mean, every single art, every single, uh, yeah. you know, every single uh, research study says, well, of course, more research needs to be done. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm waiting for the one that says, hey, hey, we got this, you know, well, uh, but, but um, yeah. you know, but if you're like, if, you're, if, if a graduate student is listening to this, I guess that's the shoes I'm trying to place myself in. If I'm, if I'm, if I'm in a grad program and I, I've got to do a thesis, a master's thesis or something along those lines, and I, I haven't quite settled on a topic, I'm kind of intrigued with uh with the the use of contracts uh you know what what would be some interesting experimental questions that are still kind of hanging around out there i'd well, like to see the application to teenagers and young adults more yeah yeah i'd like to see some more of that okay um, well i i can volunteer three participants so. <laughs> well i'll tell you i kind of they won't consent to here. it but yeah <laughs> our All right. our developmental editor who we were telling you about yeah. was so fantastic in california um, was working on our book and 
uh, kind of unbeknownst to her, her teenage son read the book. And he said to her, Mom, Mom, I think I want to do a contract with you. And he actually did a handwritten contract. She sent it to us. It's cool. And she sent us. So I I would like to see, you know, with, and it's not, he's not disabled. He's a typical teenage child. And um, I would like to see more research with an older population. And you, you well, I would love to see cross cultural um, uh, studies and Mm -hmm. the, uh, you know, Jill and I for graduate students for, a full professor looking for something to do to wrap up her her career, a major study. We've we now have these connections of uh, people interested and in access to the contracting you know materials in 15, 20 countries a- around the world, mm-hmm. and uh, could could help put them in in touch. And we of course could and should have nothing to do with the research. So we'd love to see yeah. studies evaluating. Um, the let's make a contract where families in all different variations. So one, of course, is just you, you, to, to test, you give it to families and say, you know, come back in a week or two and tell me what happened. Did you do contracts? Yes or no. Did they work? Would you share them? And, and then variations where you have um, a, a teacher or a behavior analyst who's working with a group of families who incorporates the, the method into their, into their parent training uh, and evaluates. There's some, some really big studies that were published. And I'll, I'll follow up with the links to these. They, mm-hmm. they were done not by behavior analysts per se, but they're behavioral studies, major studies that were published in maybe some of the pediatrics, uh, medical journals, but looking at the effects of but, and they called it parent training versus parent education. It was really kind of an interesting way they they labeled it. But it was on the effects on stress and happiness on parents of children with autism correlated with whether they participated in parent education program that taught behavioral strategies. Ooh. And the results are that parents reported feeling better about themselves and their ability to raise their child and less stress when they had access to this, this education. Um, So some studies along that line that specifically brings in contracting uh, as an intervention that parents are given. Yeah, that sounds, uh, that sounds very interesting. Measuring more than um, you did a, behavioral observations podcast uh, recently with, uh, with Greg Hanley. And, you know, Greg did this, uh, this paper, this uh, kind of got off his chest. He, as he yeah. Talks today's about ABA. It. Yeah. Kind of, he calls it today's ABA and, and contrasting maybe some of the early kind of iron handed, you know, I'm the behavior analyst. I know what you need to do different. Uh, compliance is what it's all about. Uh, outcomes are sort of all about on my graph. And, you know, and, and, and Greg says, well, outcomes, of course, are still critical, but the process is real important. There are a number of ways we can uh, help this child learn replacement behavior and do things. That, and if some of those ways uh, lead to better family dynamics, less stress, we're feeling better about ourselves and our kids, we had to look at that. So, the whole thing back to, you know, Montrose Wolf's uh, social validity, ABA finding its heart and so forth. Um, that ought to be, we think, a big piece of, uh, of any research on, uh, on contracting. Great, great. Yeah, so cultural areas, that's very interesting, too, because the language is so important. We were just yesterday actually Zooming with our um, French editor. And she was saying that to translate the title straight from English to, to French, let's make a contract, does not will not come across to families. It will come across like an order, like mm-hmm. you must do this. Yeah. Contract, the, the, the whole idea of contracts may be sort of alien to a French family audience. And so they're changing the title. I can't recall exactly what. Yeah, but it was beautiful. It was lovely. To, they're, so they're, they're changing the title to make it a softer, like more inviting way of, of speaking to families. So this, I mean, this, these are very subtle differences, yeah. but it would be so interesting to, to compare the, 
you know, linguistically, how our the terminology, even you know, the straightforward, non-technical terminology will come across to families in different countries. So I asked that when I was Azerbaijan, this title, I won't even try to pronounce it. So and it's let's discuss. Let's discuss is the title mm. of their contract, a positive way to change your child's behavior. So again, to make it, you know, culturally uh, appropriate. Um, so when we, when we work with the different groups that are doing the translation, um, we, we not just encourage them. We, we say, we really are counting on you. We need you to help take this and, translate it in a way that is meaningful to contemporary family life. Culturally appropriate um, to your, your situation. Yeah, yeah. Have you guys done any work with like state departments of like child welfare? You know, they all go by different acronyms in different states here in New Hampshire. It's DCYF uh, and things like that. You know, a lot of these uh, agencies are charged with going into situations where parents have been, um, gotten referrals from for abuse and neglect and things like that much like some of those uh, parents you worked with uh, early on Jill that you described mm-hmm. uh, at the beginning of our conversation um but at at, at a more i guess state level or sy- uh, systems level uh has uh have you guys had the opportunity to talk about incorporating these in parent training programs or or anything like that at a uh at a, at scale Obviously, the books, you know, are, are are one method of doing that, certainly. And I'm just trying to think. Jim, the reason I ask is uh, Jim Carr keeps nudging me to do a, a show on child welfare, which, Jim, if you're listening, I'm I'm I, I'm very much interested in doing. I'm not ignoring you, uh, <laughs> but uh, we'll, I'm, I'm going to do it. Uh, so, but I'm just curious as we're chatting here that just that thought to occurred to me that you've got a system that has a lot of evidence behind it. It can be explained relatively easily using everyday terms, mm-hmm. uh, et cetera. Et cetera. So in my mind, I'm imagining like train the trainer models and getting people out there work, you know, uh, case workers working with families who are uh, otherwise using ineffective or coercive, overly coercive parenting techniques, et cetera, et cetera. Mm-hmm. Well, well we, we haven't made the connections yet. But I had the idea that we should try to connect with Head Start because they deal with young children. They don't deal with, deal with parents and families. Mm-hmm. And this would be, a, a, you know, a, an easy way really for a parent, uh, a group leader to structure a parent, a parent group mm-hmm. over the course of six, eight weeks, whatever it would be. So we're, we're hoping to look into this, but we haven't yet. Um, as far as what you're talking about, uh, you know, through child welfare, we don't. We don't have any contacts. We haven't pursued that unless. Okay. Chris and I no, know. but I'm. I'm just thinking. I'm smiling, Matt, where you were saying that because I'm suspecting, and Jill and I are hoping among your millions of behavioral observations <laughs> podcast <Millions. laughs> listeners out there, there's uh, a couple hundred of them who are who have that uh, that motivation and have those connections and. And then it, lead, it kind of leads back to your question about uh, important research to uh, to do as well, uh, and maybe there's some uh, some opportunities there for uh, again whether it's a dissertation, a master's thesis, or mm-hmm. somebody um, who who works for a, an agency like that, and and brings the idea and says you know why don't we do a little pilot? Why don't we Let's try evaluate it. this and mm-hmm. try it? You know, very good, very good. That happened. Mm-hmm. Excellent. Excellent. Well, I have uh, succeeded in holding you guys way over your time. I want to be respectful of it. Of course, I've got a couple of wrap up questions here. Uh, So um, two of them, you know, so you guys have been at this for a while uh, and you've seen the field of behavior analysis kind of uh, explode, I suppose, uh, you know, right in front of you and you've had a front row seat to it, certainly. And had uh, uh, had a, had a, had a ma- major role in, in, in that 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 we didn't even get into. I, th- I think we mentioned that that book one that other book once, but uh, um, that, that's that, another show. <laughs> that's a, that, yeah, that's another series of shows, certainly. Uh, <laughs> but uh, anyway, um, so I, I'd like I'd like to get your perspective of what your 
what your hopes are for the field of behavior analysis moving forward. So, you know, if we got in a, you know, like a time machine and went, you know, 10, 20 years down the road, what would you like to see the field as, uh, you know, where, where would you like to see the field? Uh, talk, talk to me a little bit about that. Well, I'd like to see more applications in general education. Special education, I think we've made great inroads, especially now with um, autism treatment. But um, in regular classrooms, teachers very often are reluctant to use evidence-based methods. We see this with reading, especially, Mm. where um, we have some research-based methods that are very effective, but yet teachers don't like to use them. And school districts, even in the face of positive evidence to show student progress, will reject direct instruction or something like that um, for a whole variety of reasons. So I would like to see inroads made, more inroads made into general education. What about you, Bill? Yeah, Murray Sidman referred to the gap between kind of what is known about designing effective instruction and a class and typical classroom practice, he called it an abyss. I mean, just a huge, Mm. huge difference. Um, And it's not that teachers don't work hard and care. Teachers work like dogs. And what teachers are expected to do today, it's it's insane, unbelievable. Um, Our our daughter's a teacher of the Columbus uh, City Schools. And, you know, it's so it's just so easy for us to go in and think we've got some and we do have some answers behavior analysts. We've got some powerful, wonderful exemplars and interventions and and, and research, but to plow in and uh, to expect this teacher who's just working like crazy and being pulled from one end to another, and who unfortunately in many cases in general education, you know, his or her teacher training um, did not focus on the science of behavior change. Mm. It, it focuses on it just what they call, like the art of teaching, yeah, being yeah. creative. That's really the most important thing a teacher can do instead of being effective, which is yeah. more to the point, I think. So there's another show, education. Right. <laughs> yeah, But yeah, I'll, just, sure. I'll just drop one other uh, kind of thing. Um, um, uh, we just learned yesterday, uh, Tom Critchfield, Derek Reed, Ronnie Dietrich and Jonathan Kimball and I have uh, submitted a paper to Perspectives on Behavior Science. I just learned that it's uh, accepted and go into production and maybe make the June issue. But here's the title, ABA from A to Z, Behavior Science Applied to 350 Socially Significant Domains. And what we did in the paper, we spent couple of years or more on just collecting um, ideas, not ideas, exemplars of of research, Um, behavior analysis, ABA research, how many different domains of applications uh, could we find? And we stopped at 350, and we're not suggesting that's the right number or that there's more. We don't present it as a scientific, a replicable review of the literature. We've got an extended appendix that says how we came up with this, why we labeled the domains as we did. We used the everyday plain English language because the idea here is to, we, we hope that the paper will serve as a, a useful edu- education function, particularly for new people coming into the field of behavior analysis and those that teach them. Um, and, you know, a subtitle is ABA clearly isn't just for autism. You just in the A's, you get to 15 or so other applications before you get to AU autism. And uh, it, it's, it's really interesting. So I guess as one way to try to respond to where we'd like to see the field going, one would be for um, applied behavior analysis to continue to expand its breadth of relevant applications. But here's all these areas where many of them are just an exploratory uh, experiment or two, um, or a demonstration of a concept. There's so many areas uh, just begging for um, serious research and then developing practical applications that can be scaled up 
to uh, so that behavior analysis can actually accomplish what you know those of us who've been in it and advocates for a long time and new people coming into it not save the world but help make the world really a better place um, well that's so okay. there's so many opportunities that's a paper I look forward to reading for sure. And you've got some amazing science communicators among that author yeah. list. So well done. All right. Last question for you before I let you guys go. What did, uh, what advice do you guys have for a newly minted BCBA? I would say um, speak in simple jargon, free language. No, you're, it's not about you and all your training. It's about communicating to your audience in a way that they can understand and appreciate. So I would say plain language, clear, direct language. And I would say, don't be afraid to say, I don't know. Mm. Uh, Not only as a newly minted BCBA, but one with a couple decades uh, under your belt at the practice. Uh, None of us know everything we need to know to be uh, effective and useful in helping whoever our clients are, whether it's a teacher we're working with, whether we're the teacher and it's our students, whether it's a family. Um, And you you do already have a lot of useful skills and knowledge that you can help people with. Um, But don't feel like you have to have the answer for every question. People you're working with will respect you more for saying, you know, I I don't know that. Uh, but I'll help you find out. Let's let's try to find the answer together. Um, and that kind of also parallels with the thing of, you know, practice within your, your area of ex- expertise and training and experience as well. So don't be afraid to say, I don't know. All right. Those are great pieces of advice. So for your next, if you have another question, <laughs> Matt, my answer is, I don't know. <laughs> there we go. There we go. Yeah. I think that may be, uh, yeah. <laughs> that probably signals a good place to wrap this up. Bill and Jill, right. thank you so much and best of luck with the book. Thank you for listening to the Behavioral Observations Podcast with Matt Sicoria. You can find Matt's notes on this episode at www.behavioralobservations.com. We also invite you to stay connected with us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash behavioral observations and on Twitter at behavior podcast.